Hello, everybody. Lorenz Emanuel here. I was wrong. Kinda. Last night, I posted on YouTube a video. The video was about this East-West Hollywood Orchestra Opus Edition. The video got some traction. And for my channel standards, that kind of traction was pretty, pretty huge. So I woke up to about six hours later that I posted the video to about 500 views and uh, 30 comments, which for, again, for my channel standards, for my standards, it's massive. And first and foremost, I want to thank you for that engagement and for uh, watching my video. It means a lot to me. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. However, some of you have made sure to communicate your frustration with a couple of errors that I seem to have making in the way I described this library and the way I described some of the content uh, within the Opus edition. And upon further research, I'm here to make this video to rectify some of the things that I did say. So you guys were right. I was wrong on some of those things. Today, I want to talk about specifically the CC1 dynamic crossfade uh, sort of controversy, little tiny controversy that happened on the comment section. And I want to address once and for all where I went wrong in what I said and exactly why it is important for me to make this video. Anyway, let's hop onto the DAW and we'll check it out. All right, we are in the DAW. Got some examples for you guys to hear. Of course, the CC1, it's not the only sort of uh, mistake that I made when it came down to talk a little bit about what the Opus library actually is and does. What I want to focus on is really show you guys the, the differences between the Play Engine 1 and the Opus 1, which is something I should have probably done in the Twitch, <laughs> Twitch video last night. I guess it got lost in the rambling of a mad man. Anyway, without further ado, let's talk about two main things that I glossed over, one of which I completely got wrong. So the first thing I want to address is the CC1 small little controversy that uh, sparked in the comment section on that video last night. And yes, I was wrong. There is CC1 controlled dynamic crossfade in the Opus library. And I've noticed that a lot of people on, on some forums on Facebook, uh, some groups on Facebook, have said what happened to the cc1 what happened to the cc1 well i think that just like them i didn't do enough research and i went into it without really understanding where to look but now i do so let's go and look at that exact thing at the moment so now we are in the play engine right here and i want to show you guys the uh, the library that i use for layering and this kind of goes back to what i was telling you guys in the live um uh, stream last night is that I guess what I glossed over and I didn't really cover properly is the fact that like I don't use powerful system libraries in the play engine and I solely and exclusively use the light patches if you're using it as a main library by all means the powerful system is probably what you've been using all along but for what I do and the one that the one that I usually uh, utilize is this one which is the uh, Legato Slur Plus Portamento, Round Robin, Light, six dynamic layers, and then it fades to Niente, N-I. That stands for Niente, which basically means when you turn down the CC1, it fades to silence. Now, those are the type of patches that I've been using, and that goes for the first violin, second violin, uh, violas and cellis and basses as well. Uh, all the patches I've been using that one for the legato and then for the long, I've been using the number three, the three, uh, and it tells you the vibrato situation here. It's a non vibrato, non vibrato, vibrato, and molto vibrato. Those are the long sustained patches that I have been using, and that is controlled with CC1 controlling the dynamic crossfade. Now, that was my unit of measurement. So I went on to Opus wrongly, thinking that like, oh, okay, I can go to this and I can go to this. And look at that, there's the max library, right? And I thought that that would be what I, I would need to engage because I'm thinking, oh, new library, new things, surely, surely there is CC1 controls dynamics, right? Because it's 2021, I am expecting, you know, uh, 
East West to conform to, you know, the standards and the stables of the time. And I was uh, disappointed to find that they kept the consistency with the previous play engine and they kept the same uh, CC mapping, which I um, was aware of. In fact, I do say that into the live stream. I do say that there are patches where the CC1 controls the vibrato. Uh, and I think what I failed to mention is the fact that there is the light. <laughs> I failed to showcase the light patches. And these are basically the uh, equivalent of, uh, in terms of mapping of the ones that I have been using on play. Now, this is uh, for the first uh, point of uh, contention that I, that I want to address. I was wrong in saying that Opus doesn't offer CC1 that controls dynamic crossfade. I was absolutely wrong. And I apologize for that misinformation. Now, I hope that now this clarifies for those of you that are considering Opus and maybe they have been swayed away by me saying that there was no CC1, what is going on here and, and ranting like an absolute madman. Please, please, please reconsider because I was wrong and I have been corrected by the community. Thank you, by the way. So now, second point that I want to address here is the actual quality of the scripting and the engine in Opus, which I didn't actually cover at all. I covered some sounds, I covered some patches, but I didn't cover actually what was done in the back end of this instrument, which is quite remarkable. Now, let's go and look at it. The first track I have prepared here is the, um, of course, like I showed you, it's the play version of First Violin's uh, Legato right here. And let's listen to this. Great sounding strings library, East West went absolute bananas with the way they sample these instruments. But I have few problems with it. The first problem is the way this slur portamento kicks in, the way it gets triggered. It's very artificial. There's a bunch of artifacts in the way that get triggered and it becomes even more evident once we switch over to the Opus version, and check this out. This is a whole another ball game. And it, it and, and you can you can listen to it the way the legato gets engaged. For instance, let's let's do a comparison with this. This is the play, the play engine. So the, the slur is actually a little bit out of tune, if you notice. But in Opus, a lot smoother, a lot softer, a lot more organic, and, and way more realistic. Another thing that I've noticed is that using the same exact parameters, these are copies of each other, the dynamics kick in way smoother than in the play version. Notice how this crescendo right here is played. And now... Way more realistic, way more human, uh, in, in, my, uh, in my opinion. Let's listen to that one more time. You hear that release trigger? In Opus, uh, it's a lot better. Now, of course, I, one can go into the play engine and work on that release trigger right here. You can make that release a little longer. You can work that, you know, uh, to taste and it works. But the problem with the ADSR is that it is artificial. It's not a natural uh, sort of room or, or a natural release um, that, that, you would, that you would engage. But in the case of Opus, they did, uh, they did uh, compensate for that with a much more natural release, in my opinion. 
that's that's believable. All right, so incredibly usable and and far more sophisticated when it comes down to the actual uh, scripting in the background. You can tell that the portamento and the slur are engaged properly this time around. It's natural. The volumes are mixed well, and it, and it's and it's edited very very. Well, let's move over to another instrument that it's uh, where you can really see the improvements a lot more clearly. Now, Hollywood Brass is one of those libraries that I used solely as a layering library. Sometimes I tend to use Hollywood strings by themselves, but Hollywood Brass is a library that I use exclusively as a layering device underneath either Cinebrass or Albion Brass or Talos, or Jaeger, or Spitfire Symphonic Brass. By itself, you can really notice a couple of big issues with the play version of this library, which has incredibly sloppy release triggers, and the way the sound artifacts in the legato transitions are very obnoxious, uh, and the way they, they activate are sort of a little bit out of whack, and the mixing is not done properly. So it needed a little bit of a revamp, but just how much revamp they got, it's actually pretty incredible. Now, let's look at this. Now you can hear that the legato passages there are problematic in a little bit. The sound itself is great, but just the triggers are a little out of whack. And so the, the legato sample gets triggered, but it's not really balanced with the volume. There's a little bit of a artifacts, especially between this note and that note. So it's very audible and, and actually disturbs quite a bit. Let's listen to the Opus version of this. Again, we find that the CC1 and the, the dynamic uh, crossfade is 100 times smoother and it's more natural and more organic and it works a lot better. These artifacts, especially between this note and that note, which seems to be a little more problematic uh, than the rest of them, it's almost inaudible. It's there, but it's masked and it's balanced properly, as opposed as this, also, the beginning of the note, it's a little weird. So it's a little, it's a little inconsistent. It wasn't, it probably wasn't performed extremely well. That is clean, clean entrance. As opposed to this. There's some dirt there uh, that has been addressed and Opus has solved that clean the legatos are natural they sound genuine and they sound very believable this has made hollywood brass usable by itself again in my opinion this is a great step forward now in conclusion i want to prove that opus it is a viable option uh, and also that yes, I was wrong about the CC1. And I am so glad that I was wrong because I wanted Opus to be and live up to the hype that has been getting. The product is very usable. Is this product groundbreaking? Absolutely not. They don't do anything new. They're just revamping something old. But anyway, I think that these examples have proven a little bit of a point, which is that whatever they did in the back end of the Opus engine, they have done a great job at implementing them with the old samples. And it works really, really well. The user interface is very well thought out. Again, nothing groundbreaking. This is not groundbreaking. This is basically the play engine uh, interface revamped, recolored, 
and um, reproposed as new. But there's nothing new in this interface. Bottom line is I have actually addressed what Opus uh, should be like, and I am I'm glad that I was able to rectify that stupid mistake that I made in the live stream, which is saying that it, the remapping was a problem. And it was just me not doing proper research. That's all. That's really all it was. Now, where does my argument stands? It stands uh, when I mentioned about how it is sort of silly for me that in 2021, um, a new library comes out uh, that, granted, rehashes a lot of old stuff. You know, this is considered when the Opus Edition is 130 gigabytes of new material of new recorded samples out of 980 gigabytes it's almost a terabyte with just a little portion of it with new stuff now in my mind when i when i approach a library that released in 2021 i expect the developers to to do something that it's with the time with its modern that it's fresh that it's that it's of the now and for me the idea of having their most powerful patches which are the max now called the max patches and not having a cc1 as the dynamic crossfade and instead have it controlled by brado it is consistent with the past yes it is but that doesn't mean that the past is good is this a deal breaker no absolutely not because you can remap these very easily however the, even this argument it's like well why should i remap it you know i want to open the library and i and i need to work i can't like every instance of opus that i open i have to go and um remap everything it's it's extra time that it's not being accounted for and those things for people that are on the clock people that have do deadlines add up pretty quickly now, again, like I said, I want to emphasize this. This is not a deal breaker. The fact that CC11 is, it is what it is. It's not a deal breaker. But in a 2021 library, I would expect that CC1 is, this, is mapped to do dynamic crossfade, especially because 99% of the libraries that you will buy today and in the past five, six, eight years of development have cc1 as the dynamic crossfade it is a staple it is a standard that's what every library does heck even even percussion libraries with the with the either the 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 roll swells or the or the symbol swells the symbol rolls it they let you control it for instance spitfire percussion library lets you control the roll using the dynamic uh using cc1 does this mean that opus is terrible no opus is not terrible Clearly, Opus is awesome. The library is great. The engine is phenomenal and it handles these new scripting and these new samples gloriously. The UI and the rescaling in real time, I absolutely love this. Did my opinion overnight change about Hollywood Orchestrator? No, Hollywood Orchestrator is still a great tool. I don't see people compose or score to picture with it. I see it more as an inspirational tool where you put your hand on the keyboard and like, oh, I like this idea. And then you go into your actual instruments and orchestrate that idea. That hasn't changed. I don't think the Hollywood Orchestrator is meant to replace your Divisi and your templates and your instruments and your single instruments because that just doesn't make sense to me because it, it, it should be far more complex and far more advanced and, and far more filled with patterns and things. And yes, you can make your own patterns, Yes, you can lose your time doing that. But by the time you're done, like I said in the live stream, by the time you're done taking care of all the little patterns that you create, might as well make the mock-up yourself. Um, so in conclusion, I was wrong about the CC1 aspect. I was absolutely wrong in not covering these uh, specific uh, things and these specific improvements because I feel like these are should be at the core of the review. And so I'm sorry that I missed and I glossed over over the stream. And again, I think that Opus, it is a worthwhile choice if you have Composer Cloud. It makes absolute sense. You're getting an incredible package. You're getting the orchestrator. You're getting 130 gigs of new samples. 
on top of what you already have. But I still think that if you are a medium to advanced composer, buying and spending a thousand dollars for the Opus Edition of Hollywood Orchestra outside the Composer Cloud, I don't think that makes sense whatsoever. And because there's much better libraries out there, much newer libraries out there. That being said, guys, if you guys enjoyed this video, make sure you drop a like, subscribe to the channel, and hit the notification bell. That being said, we'll see you in the next one. Bye.